Um, okay, everybody, welcome to um, National Garden Bureau's first webinar of 2024. Very excited to get these rolling again. When we get ro webinars rolling, it means spring is around the corner. So that's the great news. I'm Diane Blazik. I'm the executive director for National Garden Bureau. I have with me in back, and she does not have her um, camera on, is Gail Paps from our office, and she's going to be putting some links into the Q&A, which I might have to um, readdress um, because we do not have chat enabled. And let's see if I can do a quick... Um, no, let's see here. Host and panelist. Okay. Um, so this is something I'm going to figure out next time is how to enable chat easily on the back end of Zoom. This is a new experience for me going from meeting to webinars. As such, um, at all times, our panelists will be able to see the screen as we have it. Um, with our PowerPoint. After we get through with our PowerPoint, um, I will be turning the screen off and then you can see the lovely faces of our panelists. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our panelists. We have Katie Timoni from Monrovia. We have Steffi Hugo from Syngenta. And we have Darren Barshaw from Darwin Perennials. So welcome to our experts. And why don't you go in order that I introduced you? And Katie, tell us a little bit about more about yourself and your company. Sure. Thank you, Diane. It's good to be here. So I'm Katie Tammany with Monrovia a Nursery. We have four growing locations uh, across the country. Uh, we grow thousands of plants, including thousands of perennials. Um, those four growing locations in different climates allow us to test and trial you know, uh, perennials for uh, all kinds of uh, climate needs. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you about some of our favorites today. So I'll hand that off to uh, Steffi. Thanks, Katie. Uh, yes, like uh, Diane had mentioned, my name is Steffi Hugo. I am with Syngenta Flowers. Um, our flowers headquarters is located in Gilroy, California, um, but I am remote. I am located in Southwest Florida, so I live and breathe heat <laughs> all year round. So i um, glad to be talking about this topic with all of you today. Great, great point that you are in Florida and you live and breathe this all the time. So that's yeah. uh, lucky you, maybe. Uh, uh, right now, I think I'm very lucky compared to the rest of the country. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. And over to you, Darren. All right. I'm Darren Barshaw with Dar Darwin Perennials, and I live in Southwest Michigan. So I'm not as lucky as a Southwest Florida <laughs> person. I get the lake effect snow and uh, looking out the window, I think I got 18 inches of snow on the ground right now, but it's at least 30 degrees. So it's better than what it has been. So Darwin is the perennial, perennial entity of ball seed or ball horticulture. So we're owned by ball. We're celebrating our 10th year this year. So we're going to do some extra celebrating at our at our events this summer in regards to being around for 10 years. But what we do, we're a breeding company. We trial plants. We have our own breeders. We work with outside breeders across the world. And we bring great perennials to the market and uh, get them into your gardens. So we're excited to talk about gardening. Help you out, I hope. <laughs> Hopefully so. I'm sure you will. There is a reason we ask the experts that we ask. So um, what I was kind of thinking, maybe the first thing we would talk about is heat. Um, the the title is of this is heat loving perennials, and I know that USDA just recently altered the zone map, and so it doesn't matter who takes this on. I'm sure everybody has a little bit of information. But let's talk about the USDA zone map. What exactly does it measure or not measure? What What's your take on some of the recent changes? Let's give advice on how somebody can find their zone. So who wants to jump off on the USDA zone map? No one wants to do that. I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's all uh, new to us too. <laughs> yeah, it's all, it, it's all new, but it's, I mean, I think they can go onto the USDA website and find their zone just pump by punching in, uh, I believe their zip code. I just found one that I did that on yeah. and it's easy to find. We're now a 6B instead of a 6A. 
what does that mean? It's I think it's a 10 year average of, of temperatures, highs and lows. And I don't know if they look at snow cover or not, because we've had winters, it's been brutally cold with no snow. And so that obviously changes our, our zonage um, from year to year. I know we've had some zone seven winters here in the past couple of years and how that affects the plants. I mean, you get some freezing and thawing, um, you get some dieback, you get some strange things that don't survive, which I figured, you know, I've had a perennial on the ground for maybe three years. And then we have one of these weird winters that it doesn't come back at all. So it's kind of strange and it, and it depends, I think, on your soil. I'm in real light sand here. So if I'm not irrigated or anything, things dry out fast. And sometimes that can be the reason why the plant didn't survive winter. It wasn't ready to go into winter. So that's that's kind of my take on it. Yeah, I, I jumping on, you know, what um, Darren said, I mean, they're, they're looking at uh, temps, but, you know, there's so many other things that can affect, you know, whether a plant is happy in your, your garden. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of excitement, especially for people that were zone five and now they're zone six and, oh, this enables me to, you know, grow so many other plants. And our, our advice is, you know, take this cautiously. It doesn't mean that you should suddenly, you know, start planting all these things that are, you know, maybe, you know, maybe they would be really fun and interesting to try. You could try some of them, but um, remains to be seen whether or not that's going to work out, that zone six plant in a zone, traditionally zone five area. And that, you know, you might want to go slow, basically. Yeah. It's a good start to starting your garden and learning more about your location in general to just add on to what our other panelists have said. And, you know, it's just uh, you're looking at your environment or factors just as much as, you know, the next thing. So it's a uh, it's a start to to get things moving in your garden. So, yeah, absolutely agree. Yeah, that's good. And and I'm looking at our presentation here. It says heat loving perennials, but uh, I think we were also promoting this as extreme conditions. So, you know, we can talk about the extreme cold because I do notice that some of the questions that we got in before the webinar is there were some questions about different things in uh, winter as well as heat. So we can talk about that. Um, you know, and maybe you guys can talk right now also about the microclimates within your own garden. Um, I, I know one of my favorite tips for new homeowners is like, wait a year, let's, let's kind of see where things are in your garden and see what, what happens when there's a rain, what happens when there's a snowfall. Um, can somebody talk about that? Like what, what conditions in your yard, in your building, if you're, you know, on a high rise or something will impact what, what can and can't grow or what, might impact the needs, you know, like under an eave. Okay, they're <laughs> obviously not going to get the rain, so you have to water more if it's under an eave. So somebody want to, or all of you want to mention a few tips about that as the little microclimates or problem areas in one's garden? Yeah, sure. sure. Something that Go ahead, Katie. Oh, sorry, it's heavy. No, um, that's okay. Go ahead. Uh, something that comes to mind is the way that, you know, your plants can be protected sometimes if they're planted closer, you know, to your house, for instance. And, but sometimes they can also get a lot of, you know, extreme sort of um, heat and sun reflected off of your house too. So um, something to think about, <laughs> you know, that's a, that could be a, a, a good area to plant, you know, something that might be more tender, like, um, you know, I, we get questions a lot about uh, fig trees, actually, in the, the Midwest. And can I plant one of these hardy figs, you know, in my zone? And we always say, well, try it kind of close to your house, you know, first. Like, don't just plant it out, you know, at the end of the year. Like, give it a little bit of protection. Um, so sometimes I think about the microclimates right around your house. That's, you know, could be one. But, mm -hmm. you know, really stand back and look at, you know, the way that um, uh, you're, if you've got large trees, that provides, you know, uh, more cooling um, on your overall property than maybe, you know, other areas. I think also um, soil makes a huge difference, you know, too, as we, we talked about, you know, too. So those those can influence your microclimate um, as well as wind. You know, if you're getting a lot of wind, then the temp just looking at temperature isn't necessarily the only thing you want to think about. Yeah, and what I'd like to mention too is always where your drain spouts mm -hmm. go, 
because that creates a significant microclimate within your particular yard or your neighbor's yard, depending which way is distributed. So you might want to look at items that tend to like wet feet or um, things like that, that like Katie mentioned, adapt to a different type of soil. So that's just one perfect example to, you know, everyone deals with in some way, shape or form during the year. Yeah, I very would, good. Yep, I would have to agree with what they had said. I put, I have a, speaking of figs, I put one in a container every year and it goes in my garage. So that's how yeah. I grow it here. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, just yeah. for garages in yep. uh, your climate. Right. <laughs> That's my microclimate. Mm -hmm. And I do see, um, Darren, somebody kind of added to your comment about basing on the lowest temperatures recorded in the year. You know, that's what the mm -hmm. USDA. Um, and interestingly, it does not address the highest temperatures. You know, so it's almost like we need a heat zone or heat whatever map as well as mm -hmm. just basically the zone map. So um let's see here let's let's do one more question before we go into talking about some of these newer perennials that are suited for extreme temperatures or extreme climate conditions um the difference between hardy perennials and tender perennials because if somebody's reading that on a plant tag or in a catalog or website or something what should they know about hardy perennial versus tender perennial no their zone is the biggest thing yep. when they're going and chopping i mean and then then you can decide if it's worth buying that plan if it's not going to come back depends on how how much it grabs at your heart yeah, <laughs> yeah that's <clears throat> it okay yeah, good I totally agree with that yeah yeah okay, well said you're in agreement know your zone that's that's what we put on our website too we put it right on the front page of our website number one thing know your zone so here you go this is how you find it um so now we're going to go through i don't know what do we have uh a dozen, two dozen new varieties for everybody to talk about. And then we're going to get back to some of the specific questions that people submitted before the webinar. So I believe, Darren, that you're up with uh, some of your newest varieties and talk about like their it. climate hardiness. Attributes, yeah, both cold and hardy. So we do have the these this uh, Achille here, which is a new vintage series. We have five colors now. The terracotta color that you see in the lower right-hand side will not be into garden centers until 2025 so that's one of our 2025 intros the other four colors are available and have been out in the market for i want to say probably four years this is a, a landscape type yarrow so it's going to be in that 28 inch height but it stands up tall like a soldier uh, some of the older genetics would flop open if they had heavy watering or wind and the stem would, would break and be very fragile uh, the other point of the name, the, the vintage part of the name is that these flowers age kind of to an antique look instead of going to a straight brown or black. So they really have a long uh, shelf life in the garden or, or on a retail bench if you're a grower. It's a fantastic line uh, for, for mid-border. Uh, we do have a small smaller front of the border one as well, but this one's a nice mid-border. So that would be the vint new vintage series of Achillea. Thank you. Uh, Bernera frostbite. Normally, I wouldn't have said a Bernera would be good for heat. Uh, it's great for cold, but this one we introduced two years ago, and there's been we've had, there's been a Berneras in the marketplace for years, uh, as far as competition. But what we chose this one for one of the reasons was that the foliage held up under dry conditions, unlike some of the other uh, Bernera that we see in the marketplace. So we put that as a as a big attribute because they usually midsummer. They'll brown up. I mean, if you don't have irrigation, this this plant will not hold up for you at all. But you, it does need to have some irrigation. But otherwise, it's tough as nails. It gets a nice forget me not bloom on it in the spring. But it's really all about the foliage and it's dairy and rabbit resistant. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> Whoops, I went to. Yep. Okay, and then uh, for your pollinators, this Euphorbia, Eupatorium Euphorbia ruby. It is a mouthful. Uh, this is a Joe Pye weed, but it's in that, I want to say it's about a 32-inch variety, so it's not going to get like you see going on, uh, along the roads, which gets six, eight feet tall. Uh, can tolerate, this can tolerate wet conditions. It can tolerate drought conditions. Very cold, hardy. It's a prairie plant, basically, too, so it's very tolerable of a lot of conditions. Heat and humidity. Can't think of anything that really bothers it as far as pests, um, and it's just it stands up bright in your late summer attracts the butterflies and everything like crazy. It's just a fantastic plant. When it's not in bloom, it has a really nice 
uh, dark kind of a purpley bud on it as well. So it's attractive for a long period of time. And then the Hookra Big Top Caramel Apple, we introduced this a couple of years ago and we're getting ready to reintroduce probably in 26, it's looking like. These are large scaled Hookra. So these are what I call like a landscape Hookra. The, the leaves are as big as my hand. Um, very nice. This is that similar to caramel, which has been on the marketplace. You get those copper, red, and yellow tones. Not really any flower on them, but these will get 24 to 28 inches around and about 16, 18 inches tall. Very nice plant. Can take a lot of conditions, uh, hot and cold. Uh, it's a very showy plant. Unfortunately, deer do like to eat those and probably rabbits. I know they do in my yard. But hooker, big top, caramel apple. Look for more colors coming down the pipeline from us on that. And what we got here, okay, a couple of them on here. We got Nepeta Junior Walker, which you guys I'm sure are familiar with Walker's Low and some of the other Nepetas that are out there. Junior Walker is a variety that we came up with probably seven or eight years ago. And it's a big improvement as far as Walker's Low. Really, the name's funny because it's really not that low. It's a tall plant, kind of flops open. This one gives... Much better mounded habit. You're in that 14 to 16 inch range. Height width, you're going to be probably two feet. But again, a pollinator plant. Uh, this one, if you cut back, it'll reflush and continue to reflush, but it can take the heat and humidity. Drought doesn't really like overly wet conditions. And then also we have on there a Coreopsis uptick in the background. We have an uptick. The uptick series is five colors now. We have a straight gold coming out for 2026. <laughs> So this is a Coreopsis that I call it a no-brainer for the gardener and for and for the grower because it's it's really easy to grow. Very all five colors are uniform, and this will flower throughout the season. A little deadheading there here and there will help, but really no disease or insect pressure on these plants at all. They're just a like I said, they're a no-brainer uh, for my gardener for anyone's garden. And then Provoscia Crazy Blue. So this is a, a Russian sage is the common name. There's a lot of them out there. This one we chose as, as ours because of its habit. It, the foliage actually kind of um, intertwines together and keeps that upright compared to some of the other varieties that are more vase-shaped and kind of will flop open as they get larger. And then this is in that, I want to say 24 to 36 inch range height-wise, good late, mid to late summer color. Um, again, it's a pollinator plant, but that blue is just that blue color with the silver contrast is outstanding. So Provoscae Crazy Blue. And then Phlox Kapow. We have a Kapow series and we have a Super Kapow series. Super Kapow is going to have a bigger flower, uh, a little bit bigger foliage. But with the Kapows, these are very disease resistant, heat loving, drought, very drought tolerant, uh, very like I said, disease mildew resistance is, is resistance is huge on these, and that's what we were shooting for. So we got five colors in the Kapow series. Very tough, very hardy, mid to back of the border for your garden. And then Salvia Blue Bayou. This is our our favorite one. You're going to see a lot of this in the in the marketplace. We won the All American Selection National Award for this plant. So that means it works north, south, east, west in containers in the landscape. So this will be a replacement for Salvia May Night if you've used that in the garden over the years. Uh, this has been out three years. We won the award last year. It was a top pick at uh, Colorado State, UGA, some of the other places that we trial at uh, down in North Carolina. Stands up tall. We've had it reflush four or five times without any deadheading. If you're deadheaded, it's good, of course, be more of an improved flower of power. But it stands up tall, does not lodge open, unlike some of the older varieties that are out there in the marketplace. So Salvia Blue Bayou. Thank you. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I put the AAS winner last there, you know. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, Katie, over to you now. Uh, great. Well, actually, and I should say we grow a lot of Darwin perennials. Yes, we do. Thank plants. you. In trial. Yes. And uh, and just, you know, uh, watching Darren's presentation, I was like, oh, yeah, we got that one. And it's great. <laughs> um, so I approached uh, my list thinking about extremes, you know, to not just heat, Diane. So there's a few in here that I'll talk about that 
are good for other kinds of extremes. But uh, Dazzle Rocks Sea Lavender, you know, most limoniums are, you know, for zone like, you know, nine to 11 where I am, I'm in California. But Dazzle Rocks um, is a limonium that's a lot hardier. Five to 11 is pretty interesting. And it's just, it's a pollinator magnet. Um, it's an incredibly like bloomiferous <laughs> plant. I mean, it, unlike other limoniums and it's, it's got that really pretty, not the dark purple that you associate with most limoniums, but this uh, lighter shade. It was hugely popular when we had our open house expo with garden center customers. So I expect that this plant will be, you know, as widely available as you know, we can keep up with demand next year. I think it's going to be pretty exciting. Um, so great pollinator plant can tolerate, you know, really tough conditions, particularly um, in colder climates. So this is not necessarily a new plant, it's new-ish, but spectacular cast iron plant, um, you know, cast iron kind of says it all. Um, you know, it, it likes the shade, so, but it can take, you know, dry shade, which is really uh, great. Um, and, you know, adapts to heat really well. It just, you know, it's, it's tough, tough as nails. So if you're looking for something mm -hmm. that has lush foliage in your dry shade situation, this is a really a great, um, great one for that. Uh, Tropicana canna, um, again, it's sort of a new-ish uh, canna. Um, and love this one because it can take extremes. So Steffi was talking about, you know, sometimes you have plants that, you know, can take really wet feet and then can also respond well in the, in the extreme heat. So this is one that can handle those um, fluctuations, both in your soil and in your climate. Um, just, you know, I love it. It's, you know, incredibly like a bright pop of color. Um, and, and again, it has that lush look in the heat of summer. Um, so it looks really great in a, you know, next to a pool, tropical, you know, style uh, garden. Um, you can, okay. Sedums. So a lot of sedums um, will kind of fall open, split a little bit. And one of the reasons we love evolution chocolate is it just stays really robust. It doesn't have that splitting, you know, habit. It's really sturdy. Um, it, it will die back, you know, in, in, you know, the extreme cold, but then it'll, it'll bounce right back. It's, it's a bulletproof uh, sedum. And I love, love, love that dark foliage, you know, with the bright pink. Um, we're, we're still seeing that interest in dark foliage. Um, so, uh, so this is just, a, you know, a lovely bit of color that um, feels a little bit more modern um, for sedums and yeah, can, can take that, that heat. So great in containers, great in the landscape. So this is, you know, something that I wasn't thinking, you know, heat loving uh, so much perennials. Um, wonderful hosta that can tolerate extreme cold conditions and humid, you know, really humid summers. Um, I think, you know, variegation, still a huge interest. We're seeing, you know, so much, you um, interest in our variegated hostas. This one, you know, also the flowers can be a, a hummingbird, you know, attractant, which is, you know, lovely. Um, so, you know, I know that sometimes deer like hosta in, you know, other areas, but in places where deer are not prone to eat it, it's a really good, uh, good option for extreme temps. And I have to interject that 2024 is the year of the hosta for mm -hmm. our NGB program for perennial. Mm -hmm. So yay for the hosta. Yeah, we grow many, many uh, different kinds. So Russian sage, you know, Darren was <laughs> talking about uh, a great looking one as well. We love this one. We've, you know, tried it, <coughs> sorry, at our um, Oregon and California nurseries. Love that it doesn't flop. Um, it stays compact, which is great. It is, you know, uh, deer resistant um, foliage. Uh, and, you know, we were talking about microclimates earlier and places that can get really, really hot with reflected heat, either next to a house or, you know, along a driveway. And this makes a, a just an incredible option for that. I think that um, the Perovskia, we're just seeing, you know, it's a, a staple in, you know, hot um, drought areas. Um, and so I'm excited to see so many good improvements on the market, <clears throat> including this one. And then see you tomorrow, daylily. So daylilies are 
Um, just, you know, one of those bulletproof can take extreme climate conditions plants. This is zone four through 11. That really tells you what daylilies can do. Um, but what's great about the CU Tomorrow daylily is that it actually has blooms that, you know, will last longer than a day, will stay on there um, up to five days, which is, you know, gives you a lot more color, a lot more bloom um, over the season. So super excited about this one. The yellow is more of a It's a little more of a kind of yellow slash sort of lime green color, really bright in the landscape too, really different. And that is new, new for this year. Super excited about this one. And then uh, hookeras, you know, we were um, looking at uh, the big top caramel apple, which I, I, I just love. This one, the Nord Northern Exposure Series is more cold um, hardy than others. It's rust resistant. It's also comes in these really incredible colors. Um, I love the amber because it just glows, but also we have a silvery version and I think um, silver foliage, people are really, you know, more and more drawn to silver foliage and the, the silver Northern exposure has a really beautiful kind of uh, reddish underside and it, it, it takes extreme conditions, you know, really, really well. Um, one more thing I'd say about the, uh, you know, figuring out your zone is that um, on Monrovia's website, you can actually enter in your zip code and search plants by by your zone too. You'll, we'll give you your zone and then you can filter like looking for certain, you know, landscape solutions. You can do that um, via our tool called My Plant Finder if you're interested. Um, so those I think are my, all of my selections, but I'm excited to see what Steffi has. Yes. And before we go to Steffi, if you can bear with us one minute, there's a couple questions here. So Darren, sure. we're going to go bounce back to you. Um, the Kapow series, yes. how wide do they spread? They'll spread, I want to say, after a couple of years in the garden, you'll probably get maybe 20 inches, 20 to 20 to 24. It's not it's not an invasive runner like some of the other flocks are that'll go underground stuniferously. This is more of a typical flocks paniculata garden garden type flux. Okay, great. Thank you. And mm -hmm. then Katie, the limonium, how is it for cut flowers? Oh, it's excellent. I neglected to say that, but it is such a great cut flower. Um, it's That's a huge reason to grow it. It's pretty incredible. Okay. And how does that same plant handle heavy clay soil? Um, heavy clay, I don't know. I, I know it handles, you know, salinity in soils really well. Um, but the clay, I'd have to, I'd have to do a little research, which I can do quickly. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Okay, Kate, uh, Steffi. Now we yes. can go on to yours. Uh, Wonderful. But if anybody else has questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A as we go. Okay. All right. Well, uh, welcome to Syngenta Flowers Perennials. So I have a couple oldies but goodies and a couple new ones for us all to take a look at. So this one is a tried and true perennial for sure. Um, as Darren mentioned, they have it in their lineup. Uh, we do as well. Um, perfect for heat loving with the name Desert Eve, of course. Um, just loves that hot, dry summer conditions. And as you can see, um, both of these pictures, one of close up of the flower, just really bringing out some red, vibrant summer colors for us in the garden. And uh, to the left hand side, you can just see this plant is just with a plethora of flowers and buds to come. Um, both of these are taken in the south. So this was in North Carolina and uh, in the heat of the summer, uh, June. So you can see how well it performs. Uh, next one up, same series. So Desert Eve, this is yellow. This is kind of emulating, you know, your Achillea moonshines, which is, you know, a tried and true for many of us, but it gives us a more compact habit, a little bit more controllable in the garden, doesn't get as crazy, but still really bright, vibrant yellows, perfect summer colors. And again, just to really show, um, how much capabilities that, you know, it can bring us all kinds of summer joy in the heat. Uh, up next, this one's a new one for us. So this is Echinacea Prairie Blaze. Um, this is really exciting because we have four different colors to offer on this one. 
And I love the orange sunset and the golden yellow, but by far my favorite is the vintage lime because you're getting an outer rim of a chartreuse lime color, uh, hence the name. But then uh, closer to the cone, you have a really nice pink tone to it. So it just goes to show you how you can create some versatility in your garden within this series. So I gave the example of using the vintage lime and the green as creating that English cottage uh, look, but then you can take that orange su sunset and the golden yellow and create that bright eye-catching vibrancy uh, in your garden to bring out those heat loving colors. If you're going on that kind of a color scheme and um, as we all well know, echinaceans are awesome for pollinators and they're really great. So they just uh, keep on pushing color from summer up until fall and uh, keep that garden looking pretty spectacular. And next up, I want to show some uh, of these echinacea in the garden beds down in Miami. And they are just loving every single bit of the heat down here. So um, really just holding on to its color very nicely, bulking, creating that um, as we continue through those summer months and uh, really just showing uh, how well they, they do through the garden and just having a blast in it with all that heat down here. Uh, next one is a Gallardia. Uh, this is a Sunrita, so a full full series from us. This is a tried and true perennial out of our uh, assortment. And I'm a big fan of Gallardia in general. These things are just nonstop in the garden. And when I say hot and dry, these guys just absolutely love it. You can see it anywhere um, in the roadside uh, street corners uh, around here in Florida, but then you can be out in the Rockies in Colorado and see them doing their thing as well. Um, and they're just uh, create that blanket as their common name is blanket flower. And they just keep getting better and better every single year. So within this series, we have uh, four different colors. Most people tend to like the yellow red ring. Some like the red yellow tip. Uh, some do like the golden yellows, the burgundies, reds, things like that. But whatever your garden taste might be, um, there's uh, an option for you. And I have to say that every time I see these in a garden, wherever it might be across the country, the bees just love these things. And it is just a, a massive attractant uh, right there. So big, big favorite in my book for sure. And uh, I think all three of us agree that uh, Perovskia is uh, probably one of the most heat tolerant and heat loving uh, perennials out there. So you can tell from all of us that um, top of our list for sure. So um, Zephyr Compact Blue is uh, a new one that we have coming out this year and um it's it's awesome. Ours is going to be a little bit more compact, so not huge. You can most rest in stage. You're always going to see in the background of a perennial garden. This one can take front and center because it has a shorter, more compact habit to it. Um, so really, you can notice those minty green flowers and uh, foliage, and really get that nice blue um, from those tubular flowers, which is awesome bring those pollinators front and center to you. And it holds a really nice face shape. It's tight, like I said, compact and really, really enjoying that um, front and center spot. So um, excellent for, you know, we throw out the term xeriscaping. Uh, you want to create those dry, hot areas. I think Katie put it in there as a really nice um, item as well, where it's just hot, dry. That's it. That's, that's this perennial. So, um, and then you look at Mediterranean or cottage gardens, the versatility is here on this particular, uh, Perovsky in general from across all of us as, as breeder companies. And, uh, yeah, really want to, to note this one as a uh, top pick for everyone. Okay. It looks like that was the, yep. the 
Last of yours, Steffi. Yep. Um, here's a quick question. While you guys answer this question, I'm going to quit sharing my screen since we don't have uh, anything else to put on the screen. So for all of our attendees, you are now going to see the lovely faces full on your screen. Um, but the question here of some of these new varieties that you guys talked about, or maybe some other perennials, are they can they be used in teas or salads? Are they edible, of course, depending on how they were grown? But do you guys want to um, bring up any suggestions for uh, any of these perennial flowers that can be used in teas or salads? I would caution on that one, just mm -hmm. as my personal opinion. Um, you just don't know uh, a lot of the time, and uh, I would rather go to a natural store to make sure you're getting what you're looking for for health reasons or consult your doctor. <laughs> yeah, I think I would advise that too. I don't think any of the ones that I listed I'd recommend <laughs> doing that with at all. Um, we are growing a new, um, oop, I see I'm frozen. We are... Uh, we are growing a new uh, camellia. That's a tea camellia. That's that is used in, in teas, but that's not a it's not a perennial and it's not you know heat tolerant. So, um. and Steffi, uh, looks like somebody wants to know in SWS, maybe um, Southwest Florida. And do you know of any garden centers carrying some of your products down there? Uh, yeah, there's plenty of them around. Uh, we have some few uh, native nurseries. We also have uh, another one, Driftwood Garden Center, um, carries a lot of things from uh, this area in our genetic lines, as well as others. And uh, yeah, I think that's a great place to get started. And then you have uh, your local Home Depot, Lowe's, Walmarts, all that goodness that uh, we work with the various growers. I'm sure all three of us do. Um, where you can find all of these products there as well. And I'm pretty sure it's safe to say that you guys chose products that you know are going to be out in the market. So, you know, will they be everywhere at every time? Probably not. But mm -hmm. um, I know that all the breeding companies are doing a wonderful job of trying to get them to the home gardener. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. So I wanted to ask you guys about your plant trialing. So when you're trialing these plants, and I think, uh, Katie, you might have mentioned that in your intro, um, like how many different places do you trial? It's a perennial. How long do you trial them? I know with AAS for our winters, we make sure it's three winters. So we overwinter for three winters, which basically gets uh, three summers also. Um, but talk about that trialing. I know I heard a lot of you talk about pollinators. Maybe you can talk about <clears throat> some of your trialing observations when it comes to pollinators. So that's a big question. I'll just toss it out there. It is big. Um, I'll start out, I guess, with our, with Darwin's trialing. Um, it depends on the trial site. Like you had, uh, well, Colorado State, I had mentioned before, they typically uh, leave their plants in the ground three years. Our trialing site um, in our gardens, at, we're in West Chicago, where Ball's headquarters is, we typically will leave in. It depends. Sometimes it's three to five years, but it just depends on spacing or if it was an odd winter that we want to see it uh, again. You know, when we had, I mentioned we have had maybe some zone seven winters when we're kind of cautious on what, when and how we place the zonage on plants. So we're a little more uh, conservative, I guess, first before we really know um, but and then we do overwinter trials as well in containers for our growers. So we we kind of cover both ends of that. But it depends on the trial site. We got them all across the country, all across the world. It depends. Some are one year and they pull them out unless we ask. And you know, a lot of that comes with as uh both the other panelists know, it comes with a fee. So we have to pay, you know, pay to have these these plants in the garden. And if we want them for another, a couple of years, and you know, it's it's fine, it's worth it to know. Um, and then we have a trial site in Elburn, Illinois, which is further west of Chicago, which is open farmland, which really is kind of really brutal conditions that we overwinter in the ground and we go evaluate for landscape use and things like that. So it really depends. Universities, um, uh, like um, trial gardens and things like that, it all depends on what they want to do and how much room they can have or if we are asking to keep them longer, they will. So it, it kind of varies, but we do 
we do test quite a bit before we launch a product for heat and humidity and mm -hmm. cold hardiness. <clears throat> Yeah, a lot of it, uh, we do the same. Uh, it's a lot of university trial testing is where you get the wide ranges uh, of across the country and how adaptable a product is uh, for, you know, the masses and the general public. And I think we take that data um, pretty, pretty well for just collaborating on what we can do to either enhance the product or promote certain features of it. Um, and you wanna see those extremes too, whether it's winter or summer. And I think that's what a lot of the university sites provide us. And plus some of it comes down to um, our grower sites and who's growing it here and who is able to produce a lot and, and their feedback that they share with us, which is extremely important to to all of us in general. And if it works in a certain area, that's where, um, you know, we all benefit out of it too. So I think that's some, some good pieces just to, to add on there. Yeah. We're, we're really more of a grower than, you know, Syngenta and Darwin are, are, are breeding. So we rely, um, we, we, you know, we'll rely a lot on the data they're providing us about the, the plants that we choose to grow. And then we also do our own testing and what we call our bullpens <laughs> at each of the nurseries um, where we have a plant there and we see, you know, with very little intervention, you know, we're not going to baby it. What what does it really do? Does it stay well behaved? Does it, you know, need a lot to make the blooms come out? Is it, does it really live up to, you know, everything that we've been told? So we usually run that through, you know, a year before we um, take it to, to market. Um, we're trialing in, you know, the heat and humidity of uh, Georgia, where we have a nursery, and then California, Central California, where it gets really, really hot. Oregon, where it goes through some extreme conditions. So that generally gives us a good sense of how it's going to do. And then of course, there are always plants. I know, you know, when I visit any of you guys, like a California spring trials or something, a lot of times you will market something if it's specific for a region. And, you know, so that's always important that mm -hmm. you are pointing that out. And then the buyers know the local mm -hmm. garden center, or the chain buyers, they know, well, okay, I'm not going to try to put X in this region because that just that's going to set up somebody for failure. So it's really mm -hmm. good that this far back on the chain of distribution, you guys are looking out for everybody. Yeah. Um, I I think, Katie, you mentioned the uh, cast iron plant. Were there any others, it doesn't have to be the ones on your presentation, that you would recommend for extreme shade? <laughs> extreme, oh, dry shade. Maybe that's what I was talking dry about. Dry shade or just shade shade you know yeah. it's like yeah. it it doesn't even get dappled sun <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. that's well, another extreme condition um are you asking all of us yes yeah. i'm gonna my, i'm gonna say hellebores it would be my number one yeah choice for dry shade and it can take zero light really i got some pretty hidden that still bloom prolifically and grow and hellebores are really hot right now. They are. <laughs> They're super popular. Really Hashtag yeah. hellebores. Yeah. 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 <laughs> super yeah. popular. I think there's so many great new colors out now. And they're just like suddenly very exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I think we're yeah. going to have to consider the year of the hellebore soon. That's, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. That's on our list. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so here's an interesting question. Um, plant picks for containers. Now we're talking about extreme conditions. Mm -hmm. And I would put a little cautionary term, you know, when you're growing in container. My number one is always grow it in a big enough container because the more soil you have in there, the less you'll have to water and the more it'll be protected against some of these extremes. But uh, what what are your thoughts on some of the best picks for containers, especially like if you're in a really hot area or dry area? I can just go off of personal experience on this one. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll take a little bit from everybody's presentation because Katie's canna mm -hmm. centerpiece, throw in some Gallardia into that, <laughs> throw in some Achillea, and you have a container where you can throw in some foliage, whether it's crotons or any other maybe tropical piece that you'd like. 
And there you go. There's your container for a heat loving uh, situation. And obviously the combinations can be plenty some, but that's just one example of kind of pulling from everybody's mm -hmm. uh, uh, thoughts and ideas. Yeah. I would say uh, echinaceas would be mm -hmm. the, yeah. most of them are really good container plants that'll last, you know, flower almost all summer long without yeah. much maintenance at all. Mm -hmm. I think where I am too in uh, California, Lantana is a really easy, great mm -hmm. uh, container option. That's a really tough, sun loving, drought tolerant, you know, plant. The Dazzle Rocks Limonium that I showed that that would be great, beautiful in a container. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Um, so what I was going to comment on there is, you know, if you've got a perennial in a container and you're in an area like we are in Chicago, toward the end of the season. You're going to want to take those out and transplant them. Then you can get more years out of your perennials, right? About how many weeks before first frost should you be taking them out of the container and planting them in ground? I would say six or eight would be my guess. Yep. At least let them get established, watered in well, mm -hmm. yep. maintained. I'll we second that. Yeah, All right. Good. Six to eight weeks. Mm-hmm. What about, um, okay, so I was busy in the spring and it's middle of July and we're having 90 some degrees. Can I plant perennials in the heat of the summer or should I just wait until it cools off? And you can. <laughs> you can. They're going to need a lot of babying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Depends on heat. Yeah. For me, it's a little different up here in Michigan because I, I mean, we, We'll have some 80, 85 degree days, but not that many. Um, but just if you are planting it, just irrigation is the biggest. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're getting them plenty of water and some maybe a starter fertilizer to get the roots down into the soil a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, yeah, just maybe have a bullpen area or, a, you know, a babysitting area to get it established or something like <laughs> that. But yeah, um, it works, but you got to be, it takes a little extra care. Yeah, I I mean I, I like Steffi said too, and Darren, <laughs> you can do it, but do you really want to do that? <laughs> I think I would skip it. You know, wait until yeah. it's a little cooler. Because I'm thinking about, you know, there's some places in California where it's like 100 and you know between 100 and 110. That don't 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 put something you know in the ground. Then I think right. that that's really hard plant so think, yeah. think of yourself if you can't tolerate the heat that plant <laughs> I mean, you, could put, you could put something in a container you yeah. know I think, yeah. and, and you know do that you know yeah. certainly you can do that and the great thing about a container is okay i can move it around you know it's really exactly. it's 110 yeah. so i'm going to put it yeah. in the shade yeah. and put right. drip irrigation yeah. but then yeah. uh, you can always move it back around so yeah. so that's good exactly. um let's talk a little bit more about heat, heat waves um it, what if it gets crispy? Is it done? <laughs> I think somebody specifically was asking about echinacea. Um, hydrangeas, you know, they really droop during a mm -hmm. heat wave and if it's too sunny. So so maybe talk about recovery after a heat wave. Protection, treatment, and recovery for your perennials during a heat wave. Well, I would, I mean, make sure you're mulching. <laughs> <laughs> we yep. say that, yeah. you know, a lot, but, but really you want to protect the roots of the plant. I mean, some, the plant could will, the plant could look like it's suffering a little bit, but if you take care of the roots, it'll, it'll bounce back. So really be thinking about that, you know, watering yeah. appropriately, using mulch. Yeah, it looks down like, yeah. like in echinacea, for example, somebody mentioned that, and maybe your question, the foliage is, is dying back or crisping up. Look down in the crown of the plant at soil level too, and just see if you still have like a viable eye. You see some green, yep. and it's it's hard um, to the touch, not mushy or anything like that. You, that plant will more than likely survive and come out of that. Yeah, just think of the roots as the lung system of the plant, yep. and as long as they're happy, you're more than likely going to make it through. Uh, the heat situation that you're in. So um, just as a little tool to dig around the plant and see how they're looking. If you have some nice white, healthy roots, it's always a good, good sign too. And do you recommend any 
umbrellas, shade cloth, you know, is, is there certain plants you should or certain uh, conditions where you should put up some shading of any sort, or is it, let's, let's just let them go. Let, let the strong survive. <laughs> well, I mean, hopefully if you're planting the right plant in the right place, you know, you, you're not going to need to shade it. I'm thinking, you know, it might, even like I said, if it kind of wilts a little bit in the sun, it'll, it'll come back. Um, so I, I would say you really want to protect, you know, again, mulch <laughs> and make sure you're watering. That's what you need to focus on. Agreed. So it sounds like I'm trying to coddle them too much. I'm, tr I'm trying yeah, to just... stop. Like, <laughs> damn it. It's like, don't do it. They're plants. Yeah. They will, if you planted the right plant, it will survive. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what about the opposite ends? Um, cold, 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 cold. Um, you know, we've got this Arctic chill going on here and we've got consistent days that are down in the teens below zero. Um, a little bit too late for me to do anything. Um, but again, right place right plant right place is key mm -hmm. um mulch again as mulch, yep, said a few okay. times and then you know for me it's snow cover because if we luckily we didn't we didn't have any snow before this cold snap that we've had for the past couple of weeks now i said we've got a foot plus on the ground and that came just in time or i think we would have had some plant losses here mm -hmm. because of the, you know warmer temperatures and cold and it's going to warm up again so i think mulch um i've seen some people use burlap and things like that to wrap certain plants to keep you know the wind because the wind will take the moisture right out of the leaves as well if you have high wind um, i have seen in the stores i don't know if anybody's used it but there is an anti-transparent like a like a wilt proof type spray that you can put on some mm -hmm. some plants that'll help it puts a protective barrier i guess on the leaf and then it keeps that plant can still breathe but it's it's not as harsh a conditions so I have seen that in the stores for sale. And I used it years ago digging trees when I was in the ornamental tree business. We'd dig it when it was flushed out and we'd spray it with that and the leaves would be would be fine. So there's there's that option too. So that would be more for the woody perennials, trees and yeah. shrubs. Yeah, I, you know, you could probably do it on hydrangeas, you could do it on hostas and things like that as well. I think it would it would work. Read the label. Don't don't take me as an expert, <laughs> but I know it's out there. <laughs> yes. I think the other um, challenging thing is that, you know, there there was drought in like the Midwest, you know, sure. and so when plants are kind of, you know, they don't have enough water and then you go into the extreme, you know, winter, that's, that's tough. So when you can before that, like we were talking about 60, six to eight weeks, you know, before the um, frost, you know, really, you know, make sure your plants have enough water before they go into that's yeah, because I kept changing. Yeah. Right, because I was thinking to myself, "Oh my goodness, you know, how do we how do we get more snow? It's not snowing." <laughs> so this year, yeah, this year in the Midwest might might be kind of tough because of that drought, and then we did not get the snow coverage until mm -hmm. what two weeks ago, and here it is January. Wow. So um, hopefully we got got some pretty strong plants in there. Um, let's see here. Oh, here was another question about um, things kind of reversing back to the heat. Um, my 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 plant doesn't say a specific one got scorched during a heat wave. So should I cut that brown part off? Um, what kind of if, brown part are we talking about? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe like an echinacea. I mean, should you cut it cut it back or leave those stems if they got scorched? You can cut it back. It'll just promote some new growth to it. So no harm. Yep. Agreed. I mean, you, depending on what the plant is, you might cut something back and then the next leaf gets scorched. And, you know, so you, so you could also leave it, you know. I'm sure yeah. It's fine too, if you probably. leave it, it might provide a little shade cover to <laughs> the, the survival. Kind of what it is. Leaf, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need a little bit more detail on that one. Yeah. Um, so this one isn't necessarily a extreme weather condition question, but just um, so I've got a perennial and I know that this is gonna bloom the month of July, but I want color in June and August. So so Number one, talk to us about some of the breeding work you're seeing about maybe getting more flowers or what are your best tips for this continuous 
show of color all season long. Yeah, that's I mean that's gonna be per location. I can talk about the Midwest because I would start with, you know, creeping flocks and then go to like a woodland flocks and then uh, there's some of these hybrids in between that continuously I'm I'm a flo uh, flocks fan, but that will continuously uh, continue all the way through summer. We have a new a 2025 intro of some some flocks called Spring Splash, which are like uh, they're a woodland or a Dibiricata hybrid. So they're like Blue Moon has been out in the marketplace for years and May Breeze. So they're similar to there, but some some different colors. But they bloom before Subulata or yeah, no, after Subulata, but before Paniculata. And then, you know, Primula, any, I just think of any spring blooming, cool season, first, first color you're going to get, start with that and then kind of work your way through the months of when these things bloom and plant accordingly. Uh, there's, there's a lot of information out there to do that. It's just, there's, there's so many plants. Right, on, right. Look at the plant really tag, ask, look at ask tag, the find the when will it bloom in my area. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, look early blooming and yeah, but, but that's the fun thing about perennials, yeah. you know. Right. Um, you look forward to each piece of when the warm starts to you know the cold starts, you know the winter hibernation. So you got to look forward to each little piece of the season to yeah. bring some interest to your garden as well. I I do think though that yeah, the work that breeders are doing, like Darwin and Sagenta, <laughs> to to, you know, work on extending bloom time, I, you know, look at, you know, earlier bloom time. It's, it's, it's really exciting. You have a lot more choices about what you can, you know, think of as early or, you know, all season long than you did, you know, 10 years ago. Um, so that's great. I, I was thinking about the hellebores, you know, that's a fantastic, you know, early, that's what I sort of start with in my mind. And then, just building these accents throughout your garden so that you always have some kind of nice um, moment, you know, so that your yeah. garden's always changing. Um, that's kind of how I think of it, but it is so regional. As it is, it is. but uh, I like your background, speaking of other plants, ferns, I mean, you got to have the texture in there as well, yeah. not just the yeah. flowers, the texture and the color and the shape. I love ferns and you got to have the right, again, I got lots of big oak trees so I can have mm -hmm. lots of ferns. Yeah, yeah. Good, good. Uh, let's hear. We've got a, another question here, um, kind of applicable to the winter we're having right now. Um, sudden extreme changes in weather. Um, if you have temperatures above normal and then a sudden spell of temperatures that were far below seasonal norms, um, is there anything you can do? I mean, it's... I mean, probably not really, unless you're going to cover with sheets or something like that to see if that would really help. And it probably isn't going to give you that much extra protection but you're going to get you know like take texas for example a couple of years ago they hit 12 degrees after being 80 degrees hit 12 degrees for i don't remember what it was 36 hours and it wiped out three quarters of their landscape plants and they're still trying to recover down there mm -hmm. they just can't supply enough plants so yeah that extreme conditions is that's the worst thing for any plant and human and animals we and were just human, talking right. to to exactly. somebody in Florida, I didn't, she was a big horse person, and I didn't realize that horses were so susceptible to extreme temp temperature variances. And she was talking about how often she had to go out and put the fans on, put the blankets on, take the blankets off and everything. So, yeah, uh, horses are harder to care for than plants. Let's just say that. <laughs> But yeah, it's just a reminder that when you said that, that, you know, plants are living <laughs> and we can, we can give all kinds of like tips and advice, but where you, where you are and how you got that plant going to begin with and all of that really um, helps determine whether it's going to take those extreme conditions. So. Yeah, right. exactly. And I always say gardens evolve. So I plant something and yeah. so it might not be where it's always going to be, but at least mm -hmm. it's got a place. And if I don't like it there, I move. So it's always, yeah. I'm always changing things around. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. As the trees get bigger, you know, you got to move it yeah. out mm -hmm. in the shade. I, exactly. I find myself doing that. So exactly. yeah, it's yeah. Uh, be flexible, understand that they're living, right. breathing things. They will and it is mother nature. She may throw some curveballs in there. So, right, yeah. Right. Yep. And, uh, and don't, like Diane, you mentioned, don't baby them. Don't coddle mm -hmm. them. Just, right. Yeah. And right. let them do their thing. And most of the time, that's what they need. And and actually, that's one of the 
best things about gardening when you think something may be gone and it comes back. That is so yeah. exciting. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it makes you feel like you're so successful, even though you had nothing to do with it, probably. Like <laughs> magic somehow. Hey, it worked yeah. this year. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I like that. I forgot. I forgot I planted it anything. Oh, look at this. Oh, yeah. wow. I did that one. Hey, anyway. Nice surprise. Yeah. See, even the experts get surprised. Even the yep. experts forget. So we can, yep. we, that gives us all a little bit more confidence in ourselves. <laughs> right. Be easy on yourself. <laughs> okay. Uh, wow. We are already up for an hour, but I thank you guys. I mean, you, you've given us a lot to think about, a lot of new options, given us confidence to say, hey, it may not be you, maybe the, the weather, that kind of thing. But there are options for everybody. And Hopefully with a good assortment, you know, mix up your garden. It's not all monoculture or anything. You'll end up with with a great show. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here's to spring. That's <laughs> like, right. That yeah. Spring. I don't know how many it's days, ready. but it's getting close. So we're <laughs> happy about that. But Steffi, Darren, Katie, thank you very, very much. Love it. Um, I'm ready to go out and plant, even though we've got 18 inches of snow. But, you know, it'll get here. It'll be good in due time. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for having us. Appreciate thanks for it. having thank us. You. Thank Bye, you. Everyone. Thank you, everybody, for Bye. attending.